Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. As I always say, to kill some time, uh, just give me a moment to get everybody into the webinar today. I um, hope everybody's having a great week so far and uh, enjoyed the holiday weekend, uh, uh, Dr. King's birthday. Uh, and, um, and so today we have a special lecture. It's our, one of our special honorary lectures, the, the Dr. Merrigan, the Merrigan Lecture. And uh, with that, we have a special presenter, Dr. Bloom. Uh, we don't have too many updates today, at least regarding COVID. Um, we had some updates last week by, um, uh, by our usual Dr. Bowman um, and Dr. Pinsky. Dr. Pinsky has just reiterated to me this morning, no updates. The numbers are still continuing to come down, which is great to see as we head further away uh, through the winter season. Uh, that being said, uh, Rousseau, can you mind putting up the slides? And we just have a couple uh, important brief updates. Great. And I'll turn this first over to Dr. Salas. Yeah, thanks so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is just a reminder that we have the next installment of our 1619 um, project discussion series on Thursday, February 9th at 5 p.m. I will put the registration link in the chat. And uh, the topic for this um, particular episode is about healthcare. So very relevant um, to the work that we all do. Um, next slide, please. Back to you, Errol. Yeah, so we have, I mentioned last week, we have the upcoming on February 6th, CE Educator Happy Hour. Again, this is a, our first of hopefully many um, get togethers for CEs. And it's really not only just to come together and uh, and just meet up, but also here's some updates from our uh, leadership as well. And uh, really know what's going on and provide input as well um, from your perspective. So please do come if you can, even if it's briefly and uh, for some free food and drink. So hopefully we'll see you there. Great, next slide, please. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Salas. And uh, we're so excited for our upcoming Grand Rounds for February, which is, as everyone knows, Black History Month. We've, um, we're have we starting off the month with, um, I believe, in-person Grand Rounds with Joyce Sackey, um, who is our Chief Diversity Inclusion Officer here at Stanford Healthcare or Stanford Medicine. Um, and then we have Linda Villarosa on February 8th. And then our own uh, Dr. Kevin Alexander on February 15th. And at the end of the month, um, Dr. Utib Essien, who is an expert on pharmacoequity. So a great series of speakers lined up and I um, hope everyone can join us for those. Awesome, thanks so much. Can we go to the next slide, please? Great. And then next week we have uh, Dr. Kimikia, Kiz Kizmikia Corbet. Uh, Dr. Corbet is someone we have been working to get uh, speak at Grand Rounds for I think about two years now. Uh, many of you may may know her. She's been in the news a lot the last few years. Uh, she was instrumental in the creation of the Moderna uh, mRNA vaccine, and uh, she's been over the news just uh, constantly for, for a long time. So she's actually flying out here. She'll also be presenting at Department of Immunology and be meeting with a lot of her faculty for a couple of days. So we're really excited to have her. This will be in person as part of a push this year to have more and more mix of in-person and uh, uh, always have a Zoom component. Grand Rounds will always have uh, a Zoom component. Um, we'll aim to have the first Grand Rounds of the month still in person, but we're going to be having more and more in person as well throughout the year. And this is one of those. So it is in person. Please come and, and join us. Um, at LKSC 120 next week. If you can't, of course, we love having you online as well. So looking forward to that and we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. That being said, we'll go to the next slide and uh, I'm gonna turn over to Dr. Relman. Dr. Relman, thank you for being here. He, he, Dr. Relman's going to be helping uh, moderate, but also uh, introducing both the American, the, what the American lecture is about, as well as our special presenter today, Dr. Bloom. Dr. Relman, thanks for being here. Thanks, Errol. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Um, so I am delighted to welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds, which today doubles as the 25th Thomas C. Merrigan Lectureship. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to take a moment to tell you a bit about Tom Merrigan and this lectureship. Tom is also online with us today, and fittingly, today is Tom's birthday. So happy birthday, Tom. Tom Merrigan joined the faculty here at Stanford as an assistant professor of medicine in 1963, subsequently heading the Division of Infectious Diseases and founding the Diagnostic Virology Lab here at Stanford. After becoming the first faculty member to hold the Becker Chair in Medicine in 1980, Tom became principal investigator of the NIH-funded AIDS Clinical Trials Unit and then director of the Center for AIDS Research at Stanford in 1988. Tom Merrigan is an internationally known virologist, 
whose pioneering work included studies of viral pathogenesis, basic and clinical studies of interferon, and seminal clinical studies that enabled the development and licensing of many of today's commonly used antiviral agents, such as gancyclovir. His laboratory contributed the tests used to measure HIV viral load, and more broadly, he led many of the early studies whose results revolutionized HIV care. Training and education of clinical scientists has also been a goal that Tom has pursued with passion, a goal that has yielded many leaders in academic medicine over the years. In 1994, some of Tom's trainees and friends in turn decided to endow a lectureship in his honor. The first Merrigan lecture was given that year by Jonas Salk. Every year since then, the lectureship has brought a renowned scientist to Stanford who like Tom has devoted their professional life to understanding the interface between, the inf between infectious diseases, the host and their environment. This year's Merrigan lecturer, the 25th in this series, is Jesse Bloom, a professor in the Basic Sciences Division, the Public Health Sciences Division, and the Herbold Computational Biology Program, all at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. He is also an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and an affiliate professor in the departments of Genome Sciences and Microbiology at the University of Washington. Jesse was an undergraduate student at the University of Chicago, then earned a master's degree in theoretical chemistry at the University of Cambridge, and then moved to Pasadena, where he received a PhD in chemistry at Caltech under the supervision of Francis Arnold. He stayed at Caltech as a postdoc in David Baltimore's lab, and then took a position at the Fred Hutch and the University of Washington in 2011, where he has pursued his career. Jesse and his research group study the evolution of proteins and viruses with a special focus on influenza and SARS-CoV-2. They use a mix of experimental and computational approaches to gain insight into how viruses evolve in the face of different selection pressures and to understand the public health consequences of viral genetic variation. His group has sought to understand how viral mutations inform virus fitness and the outcome of infection. They have shown that each infected human harbors a diverse population of virus variants with different properties and fates. And they have developed computational models to predict possible future evolutionary paths for rapidly changing viruses like influenza and SARS-CoV-2. In a crowded and frenzied world of research on SARS-CoV-2 and COVID, Jesse has stood out as one of the most creative and insightful investigators at the leading edge. In closing, a few other brief observations. Jesse has demonstrated unusual skill in writing for and educating the public about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID in the form of opinion pieces in the New York Times and other major media outlets. He has also plays, played an important role in advancing public policy on the oversight of risky research and in calling for a balanced, open, and dispassionate investigation of COVID origins. I count Jesse as one of the relatively few scientists who is willing to follow the science wherever it might lead and to speak truth to power, even when the consequences are potentially dire for one's own personal interests. For all of these reasons, I can think of no better person to carry on the tradition of the Merrigan Lectureship. Jesse. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's a real honor to be able to give uh, this lecture today. I'm posting the link to my slides in the chat. Hopefully people can see that. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about interpreting the evolution of SARS coronavirus 2. So as I mentioned, the link to these slides is available right here and I just posted it in the chat. Uh, my disclosures, I'm on the scientific advisory boards of a priori bio, Arium, and Vivid vaccine company in Ankaris, and I'm an inventor on Fred Hutch licensed patents related to deep mutational scanning of viral proteins. 
So today I'm going to break my talk into three main parts. First, I'm going to talk about some of the conceptual principles of viral antigenic evolution. Then I'm going to talk about this really important protein domain called the receptor binding domain of SARS coronavirus 2. And then I'm going to talk about understanding the evolution of this protein domain and the implications it's had over the last few years. And I'd like to mention that after the end of each of these three sections, I'll sort of look at the Q&A box and, uh, you know, answer any questions that are there. So if you have questions as I'm giving the chat, the talk, please just enter them in the Q&A box uh, as they come to mind. Okay, so first I'd like to give some conceptual principles on viral antigenic evolution. So this is a uh, study written by the Danish physician Peter Ludwig Panum, uh, and it's called Observations Made During the Epidemic of Measles on the Faroe Islands in the year 1846. And so if you read this treatise, uh, you'll find that Peter Panum uh, does not follow the advice that we give people nowadays, which is to get to the point in their scientific papers, because the first about a dozen pages of this article are about how the Faroe Islands are these harsh and beautiful islands located here in the North Atlantic and, and how, you know, all of his observations of what they look like and so on. But eventually he gets to the point of why in 1846 he'd gone to the Faroe Islands. So the Faroe Islands are fairly isolated from mainland Europe, and particularly in 1846, there was relatively limited travel between the rest of Europe and those islands. But as Panem describes, measles had not prevailed on the Faroes since 1781, and then it broke out early in 1846, so after a 65-year absence. So what Peter Panem did is he went around the island and saw what happened during this outbreak. And he found that of the 7,782 people who lived on the island, about 6,000 of them came down with measles. But the really important thing that he noted was of the many aged people still living on the Faroe Islands who had measles in 1781, not one was attacked a second time. And so what Peter Panem is describing here, of course, is immune memory, which is this amazing thing that provides us with lifelong protection against measles. However, as I think everybody probably knows by now, we don't have lifelong immunity to all human respiratory viruses. For instance, a typical person is infected by H3N2 influenza about every five years. So why is that? So broadly speaking, you can imagine two classes of hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive, that would explain the difference between something like measles, where the immunity is lifelong, and something like influenza or SARS-CoV-2, where the immunity is not lifelong. One is that maybe the immune response to something like influenza just isn't as good as the immune response to something like measles. And the other possibility is that maybe the immune response to influenza is pretty good, but changes in the virus eventually erode that immune response. So in fact, the history of influenza virus offers a natural experiment that's sort of like Peter Panem's study of measles that we can use to sort of look at these two hypotheses. So here's the history of human uh, influenza. It's thought that influenza viruses have been jumping into humans for many centuries, but the first virus that we know about was the virus that caused this 1918 pandemic, which was very devastating. But after 1918, that virus did not disappear. It kept circulating in the human population, evolving a little bit year to year, and infecting the typical person maybe about every five years. That process continued for several decades. Then in 1957, a new strain jumped into humans, displaced that H1N1, and then it kept evolving a little bit year by year, reinfecting people. Then the same thing happened again in 1968, and that strain is still circulating in humans, evolving a little bit year to year, and infecting a typical person about every five years. So when we look across all the top part of this evolution, we can't really tell whether these reinfections are happening because the virus is changing or because the immunity is just not durable, because time is elapsing and the virus is changing. But in 1977, there was another pandemic called the Russian flu pandemic. And what happened in that pandemic is that a virus that was genetically identical to the viruses that existed in about 1954 uh, re-emerged. And it's thought that this virus was actually literally frozen and then was inadvertently re-released and, and caused this pandemic in 1977. 
So now when we look here, we've got about 24 years of time that has elapsed, you know, and whatever happens to someone's immune system over 24 years, or immunity is going to happen, but the virus has not changed at all. So what happened in 1977? Here's an article from the British Medical Journal from March 4th, 1978, called Influenza in a Boarding School. And so they describe how one boy from Hong Kong came back from a fever in mid-January. Within a few days, there were several boys in the college who had fever. And overall, 67% of the boys in the class got sick enough that they had to spend between three and seven days away from class. But they also described that of about the 130 adults who had some contact with these boys, only one of them, a house matron, developed symptoms. So I think what this is showing is that influenza infection actually elicits multi-decade immunity, at least somewhat comparable to that against measles. But importantly, that immunity will only be long lasting if the virus is evolutionarily frozen, which happened in this unusual situation in 1977 but is not the norm. And so I like to think of placing human RNA respiratory viruses on a sort of continuum. You have some viruses like measles, which undergo very slow evolution to escape from our antibody immunity. So we basically have lifelong protection. We have others like influenza that undergo rapid evolution to escape from this immunity. And so that effect, and our immunity is not gonna last for your entire life. Uh, sort of why these different viruses fall on different ends of the spectrum is sort of a really deep and interesting question that's sort of beyond the scope of this talk. I put a link here for, for some possible explanations. But what I want to focus on instead is a sort of more tangible question, which is where do human coronaviruses fall on this spectrum? And so some of you may remember back to three years ago, uh, early in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, a lot of people were actually speculating that coronaviruses would exist over here on the left end of the spectrum. So here's an article from the Washington Post entitled, The Coronavirus Isn't Mutating Quickly, Suggesting a Vaccine Would Offer Lasting Protection. However, in our group, we were sort of skeptical that these coronaviruses would behave like measles viruses. And the reason is that we'd been studying other human coronaviruses, or at least reading about other human coronaviruses because there's a number of coronaviruses, including one called coronavirus 229E that cause common colds and have been circulating in humans for a long time. And these common cold coronaviruses typically infect a given person maybe about every three years. So what we did is we first inferred a phylogenetic tree of the spike protein of coronavirus 229E. So the spike is the thing on the outside of these coronaviruses that's recognized by neutralizing antibodies. So the older sequences of coronavirus 229E from the early 1980s are here on the left, and the more recent sequences from the last few years are here on the right. And time is on this x-axis or horizontal dimension. And so there's a couple of things I want you to note. First of all, this tree has what's called a ladder-like shape. So there's one major lineage that persists through time and there's lots of other variants that are on these short branches, which mean they die out. And I'll return to what that means in a broader sense in a minute. But one feature of a virus that has this sort of ladder-like tree is that where you are on the x-axis, so where you are in time, is a pretty good indication of where you are in genetic space. So we simply picked spiked proteins at eight-year intervals across this tree, synthesized those genes, and use them to generate spike pseudotyped viral particles that we could study in the lab. We then did a really simple experiment. We took an old human serum sample collected in 1985, and we asked how well could the antibodies in that serum neutralize viruses with spikes from these different years. So on the x-axis here is the year in which the spike was uh, isolated. And on the y-axis is the neutralization titer. And a larger number means the antibodies can better neutralize viral infection. So you can see this serum from 1985 can neutralize a recent past virus, the one from 1984, quite well. But if you look into the future from 1985, you can see that the evolution of the virus is eroding the ability of these antibodies to neutralize infection. This is showing 
that coronavirus 229E is evolving to escape from these antibodies, similar to what we would see for influenza virus and different from what we would see for something like measles virus. We've also done this uh, experiment for a number of different old human serum samples. Here I'm just showing a few examples. And one of the things I want you to note is that the evolution of the virus always erodes the antibody immunity. But some people are making antibodies with specificities such that after eight or so years of virus evolution, they have no ability to neutralize the new viruses anymore. Others kind of have a gradual decline. And some individuals like this person are actually making antibodies that stand up quite well to viral evolution, where it's taking decades for the coronavirus to really erode this neutralization. And I think the existence of these person-to-person -person differences is really interesting and important to understand because you can imagine if you were to try to make a coronavirus vaccine, you would ideally like it to elicit antibodies like the one that this person over here is naturally making that stand up quite well to viral evolution. Okay, so this shows that these coronaviruses evolve antigenically. I now want to talk a little bit about some of the broader patterns. So as I've described, coronaviruses are existing over here on the rapid end of this evolutionary spectrum, more similar to influenza virus than measles. But what are the patterns that that evolution takes? So we can also look at the shape of these viral phylogenetic trees. So the coronavirus 229E phylogenetic tree looks like this. At any given time, there may be several different viral variants, but all the viral variants die out except one of them, which persists and give rise to new viral variants. Again, all of them die out except for one that persists and so on. And you get this ladder-like tree. Another way of saying this is that the virus is changing rapidly over time, but has low standing genetic diversity. This is also how human influenza A virus evolves. And when a virus evolves in this fashion, it's at least theoretically possible to use a vaccine strategy where you sort of pick a strain that will represent the viruses that are gonna be there in the future. You know, th there's no guarantee that you'll actually be able to pick that strain successfully, but at least that strategy could work in theory. Uh, coronavirus OC43, so another common cold coronavirus, split into two different lineages a number of decades ago. And then each of those lineages has been evolving in a ladder-like way. This is also how influenza B virus evolves. And in this case, it's theoretically possible to pick a well-matched bivalent vaccine because there are sort of two variants uh, co-circulating for a long period of time. And finally, I'd just like to point out that it's theoretically possible for a virus to have a non-ladder-like tree where there's lots of different highly diverse variants that all coexist at the same time. For instance, this is what the HIV tree would look like. And basically, if you're trying to make a vaccine against a virus that evolves in this fashion, you're gonna be in trouble. Okay, so what does the actual uh, SARS-CoV-2 phylogenetic tree look like? So here's a view from, from the next strain site. Uh, and you can see the patterns of SARS-CoV-2 evolution over the last three years. So early on, we had this major variant emerge called Alpha. And in sort of late 2020, uh, early 2021, there, were 21, there were a lot of Alpha viruses. But before they could spread all the way around the world, this new variant called Delta, shown here, emerged. And Delta was highly transmissible and spread very widely so that almost all the viruses were Delta. But before Delta could quite take over the, all the SARS-CoV-2 in the world, there was this new lineage ar that arose, not descended from Delta, called Omicron. And first Omicron BA1, and subsequently Omicron uh, BA2 and uh, BA5 ha have sort of dominated the world. And so one of the interesting things you can see about Omicron is that the first observed Omicron sequence, you have to trace a very long way back on this tree sort of all the way back here to find the first known ancestor. In other words, there are a lot of mutations in Omicron that nobody observed happen. And this is really surprising because people have been sequencing a lot of SARS-CoV-2 all over the world. So how did Omicron evolve sort of without anybody noticing it? So I wanna address this question, how did Omicron acquire so many mutations with no sampled evolutionary intermediates? 
So there's this principle in evolutionary biology called the molecular clock, which actually goes back to Linus Pauling and Emil Zucker Candle at Caltech in the 1960s. And the molecular clock is just the idea that if you look at the evolution of a gene or a genome or a protein or whatever, the number of mutations you have shown here on the y-axis should be proportional to the amount of time the thing has been evolving. So if we look at all of the mutations in SARS-CoV-2 in all of the clades that existed prior to Omicron, we can see they're nicely following this molecular clock. However, if we look at the Omicron clades, we can see that the Omicron clades are above uh, this molecular clock line. So essentially, Omicron has more mutations in it than you would expect for a virus of its age. And so we can now try to understand what those mutations are to gain insight into how Omicron evolved. So here I'm showing all of the nucleotide mutations in the genome. If we instead go and we just show the synonymous mutations, we can now see that Omicron roughly falls on the molecular clock. Things are a bit more spread out because the counts are lower, there's more noise, but there's no systematic trend for Omicron to have excess synonymous mutations. This shows that Omicron did not evolve by having a higher mutation rate, because if it had a higher mutation rate, it would have more synonymous mutations as well as more amino acid mutations. We can also look at the amino acid mutations in Omicron everywhere except in the spike protein. And recall the spike is the part of this virus that's targeted by antibodies. And if we look at these non-spike amino acid mutations, we can see that Omicron is also following the molecular clock. Uh, however, it just looks like that my father leave Alice. I'm kind of giving a talk, so we've got to get better. Sorry about that. Uh, however, if we look at just the spike amino acid mutations, we can see that Omicron has about twice as many spike amino acid mutations as you'd expect for a virus of its age. So the evolutionary process that gave rise to Omicron was specifically enriching for amino acid mutations in the spike. And in fact, we know the type of process that does this. Excess antibody escape mutations in spike are characteristic of viruses that evolve in chronic human infections. And to explain why that is, normally during viral transmission and sort of typical acute infections, some individual uh, is infected with a virus and they will generate mutant viruses. However, the duration of the typical acute infection is short. So before any of these mutants can spread widely, the person transmits to other individuals. And this transmission is characterized by narrow bottlenecks, which tend to lead to the stochastic loss of beneficial antibody escape mutations. However, it's been observed in chronic infections, which can last 100 or more days and generally occur in immunocompromised or immunosuppressed individuals, uh, the virus has a lot of time to evolve without these transmission bottlenecks. So beneficial antibody escape mutations and spike can appear and go to fixation, and this can happen repeatedly and can lead to a large excess of mutations in spike. And that appears to be the process by which Omicron emerged. And the last point I just want to make is that these first three years of SARS-CoV-2 evolution could be somewhat non-typical. And the reason is the substantial amount of the evolution so far, particularly early on, has been driven by increases in inherent transmissibility of the viruses, although we're also increasingly seeing evolution driven by immune escape. Based on what we know about other human endemic viruses, we expect that the inherent transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 will eventually plateau and then the ongoing evolution of the virus will be mostly to escape immunity. So some of the increased transmissibility aspects of SARS-CoV-2 evolution may be transient features of the first few years. Okay, so that sort of ends the first part of the talk. I'm just going to look quickly at the Q&A and see if there's any questions. Uh, no questions, so I'll go on uh, to, the, to the next part, which is now I want to talk about the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain, or RBD. So if we look at the long-term evolution of coronavirus 229E, we can look to see what part of this spike protein is really evolving the most rapidly. So the spike is divided into an S1 and an S2 domain, 
which are broadly involved in receptor binding and membrane fusion. And then within the S1 domain, there's an N-terminal domain and there's a receptor binding domain. Below this schematic, I've plotted where uh, amino acid mutations have occurred during the last four decades of coronavirus 229E evolution. And you can see that the mutations are concentrated in the S1 domain, and they're particularly in the receptor binding domain. So that's the last four decades of coronavirus 229E. What about the last three years of SARS-CoV-2 evolution? So now I'm showing a schematic of the SARS-CoV-2 spike, which is similar in overall principles to the coronavirus 229E spike. And I'm showing where there are mutations in the new Omicron BQ.1.1 variant relative to the early Wuhan HU1 virus. And again, you can see the amino acid mutations are mostly in the S1 domain, and they're especially concentrated in the receptor binding domain. So clearly the evolutionary selection on both uh, human endemic coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 is most strongly favoring the fixation of mutations in the receptor binding domain. And so this evolutionary observation is concordant with an experimental observation, which is that the majority of the neutralizing antibody response in both vaccinated and infected humans targets the receptor binding domain. So here what we've done is we've taken serum from either vaccinated or previously infected individuals, and then we've measured the neutralization titer. That's sort of what's shown here on the left. And then we've depleted from that sera just the antibodies that bind to the receptor binding domain and measured the neutralization titer again. And you can see there's this precipitous drop in, in all of the different conditions, which is showing that the neutralizing antibody activity is dominantly targeting the receptor binding domain. So synthesizing these evolutionary and experimental observations, I think really emphasizes the importance of the receptor binding domain. Human coronaviruses are under pressure to evolve to escape transmission blocking immunity. And they show the strongest selection in the receptor binding domain. So basically I think this is the virus's way of saying, hey, 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 these receptor binding antibodies are really what matters the most for blocking transmission. I wanna point out that antibodies uh, targeting other regions and also T cells uh, may still be important, particularly for reducing disease severity, but that probably puts less selection on the virus, uh, which is you know, mostly under selection just to transmit. And then also we know that most neutralizing activity is from these RBD antibodies, although antibodies to other domains can also be neutralizing. So as you might expect, Omicron, which probably evolved under this strong pressure to get away from the antibody response, has a ton of mutations in the receptor binding domain. Here's the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 with the mutations in Omicron BA1 shown in spheres. So this protein is 200 amino acids long, and in this variant, in one evolutionary step, 15 of those 200 sites changed, which is just an extraordinary amount of evolutionary divergence to have in such a short period of time. And so one question you can ask is, how is the virus able to tolerate all of these mutations? Because the receptor binding domain does something pretty important. It's what enables the virus to bind to ACE2, which is an obligatory step in human infection. So how does Omicron even bind ACE2 with so many mutations in its receptor binding domain? So to answer this question, we've developed this deep mutational scanning platform to understand the effects of mutations to the receptor binding domain. So basically what we do is we take the receptor binding domain and simply display it on the surface of yeast. And then we can incubate these yeast with something like ACE2 that's fluorescently labeled, and the yeast will become fluorescent proportional to how well the receptor binding domain can bind to this ACE2. And then we can just sort the yeast using a flow cytometer based on how fluorescent they are. So this is basically a way to use a flow cytometer or a, a cell sorting machine to do biochemistry. So the advantage of doing biochemistry in this fashion uh, comes not from studying one receptor binding domain, but from the fact that we can make large libraries of yeast each of which have a different receptor binding domain on their surface. And these libraries can potentially have 
tens of thousands or even a hundred thousand or so receptor binding domain mutants. And then in one experiment, we can sort all these mutants based on their ability to bind to ACE2, just sequence them and measure how all of these mutations are affecting ACE2 affinity. And this approach has allowed us to generate uh, sort of maps like the one uh, that I'm gonna show here. So these maps show experimental measurements made in the way I just described of how virtually every mutation to the receptor binding domain affects binding to ACE2. So for instance, this mutation right here, V350D is colored red because it's bad for ACE2 binding. In fact, causes a minus 3.56 log 10 drop in the dissociation constant. There are other mutations that are colored white, which have very little effect on ACE2 affinity. And if you sort of scroll through this heat map, you'll see there's a lot of red, which means there's many mutations which are not well tolerated. But there's also a lot of white, which means there's a lot of mutations that are fairly well tolerated. And then occasionally, you will get to places where you find little patches of blue, like this mutation here, N501Y. And so having these maps and being able to build them ahead of time turns out to be very useful when you're studying the evolution of the virus. So for instance, uh, in late 2020, a variant emerged called Alpha, which had a mutation in it, N501Y. We could then immediately look at this map and say, oh, that's an affinity enhancing mutation and may have contributed to the high transmissibility of Alpha. And this turns out to be a very useful approach to sort of interpret the ongoing evolution of the virus. And many of these sites where mutations affect ACE2 affinity, like 501 and 493, and other sites that I'm not going to get into right now, have been major hotspots of activity during the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 variants over the last few years. A general trend we can see when we look at all of these mutations is this buffering relationship between ACE2 affinity and antibody escape. So here I'm plotting how all of the mutations that are fixed in Omicron BA1 affect ACE2 affinity. The mutations above the red line improve the ACE2 affinity, and the mutations below the red line decrease the ACE2 affinity. And then on the x-axis, I plotted how they affect antibody escape. And what you can see is that all of the major antibody escape mutations are below the red line. So they're all bad for ACE2 affinity. And the reason the virus has been able to acquire these antibody escape mutations is because at the same time, it's acquiring other mutations which may not confer very much antibody escape, but increase ACE2 affinity. And this sort of counterbalancing of affinity enhancing mutations and antibody escape mutations is what's allowed the receptor binding domain to undergo so much evolution. And then the last point I wanna make is that this process is extremely unlikely in my view to stop anytime soon. So you sometimes hear people ask questions like, will SARS-CoV-2 run out of evolutionary space? And I would just point out that running out of evolutionary space is not something that's really ever been observed for any rapidly evolving virus ever. So for instance, if you look at coronavirus 229E in its receptor binding domain, over the last 50 years, the vast majority, 25 of 31 of the residues that contact receptor have varied. And from the types of experiments I was just describing, we know there's lots of mutations to the SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain that retain and sometimes even enhance ACE2 affinity. So many of the evolutionary patterns I was describing are gonna continue for the rest of our lives. And this is just gonna be an antigenically variable virus like influenza virus or common cold coronaviruses. Okay, so that's sort of the second part of my talk, the importance of the receptor binding domain. Uh, I'll just see if I can refine my mouse here, just see if there's any questions. Uh, okay, still no questions. So I'll, I'll go ahead and keep going. Uh, and so, uh, actually maybe one question popped up. Okay, so the question is, in studies of RBD mutations and affinity co uh, coefficients, what lab biosafety levels are needed to prevent possible escape of engineered mutations, yeast, plasmids, et cetera. Uh, so basically the types of experiments I'm describing, the yeast display or the pseudovirus experiments pose no direct uh, biosafety hazards. So 
uh, escape of those things is not really a concern because they're not fully infectious viruses. The, the relevant uh, biosafety uh, you know, concern would be whether the uh, uh, mutations are introduced into an actual replication competent virus by, by someone else. Uh, with the evolving of the RBD, do we want a vaccine that targets another location? That's a great question, uh, and people are exploring whether it would be possible to generate a vaccine that retargets the neutralizing antibodies to other domains. However, this is very difficult to do. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily easy to make the immune system retarget where it generates antibodies, and it's also unknown whether antibodies to other domains will be as potent. So this is an active area of research. Uh, I think it's an important question, but I can't offer an answer on whether or not it will be possible. Uh, and then uh, Michelle asks, what evolutionarily happened to SARS-CoV-1, which exploded several years ago and then inexplicably disappeared? So SARS-CoV-1 emerged in originally 2002, 2003, uh, and it spread, but it never became a pandemic. It was sort of an epidemic. Uh, you know, several thousand people worldwide were infected, but the virus was not quite so transmissible that it took off before it could be controlled. So a combination of SARS-CoV-1 not being quite as transmissible as SARS-CoV-2 and sort of very uh, strong and public health measures were able to sort of suppress the epidemic before it turned into a pandemic. Uh, since 2004, uh, there have been no further natural outbreaks with SARS-CoV-1. Uh, there have been three lab incidents in Singapore, Taiwan, and China, where there were small-scale lab-associated outbreaks of SARS-CoV-1, but there have been no further zoonotic jumps of SARS-CoV-1 into humans uh, since uh, 2003 to 2000, or 2002 to 2005. Uh, okay, so thanks for those questions. Uh, so for the last part, I want to go now into mapping antibody escape to interpret viral evolution. Uh, so I was describing how we can use this yeast display system to understand how mutations affect binding to ACE2. We can also use the same system to understand how mutations affect binding by antibodies. So we basically just take these receptor binding domains, incubate them with antibodies, and see which ones uh, don't bind the antibody anymore. And this allows us to map how all mutations affect binding by any given antibody. So it's an example, here I'm showing for one particular antibody called LYCOV555 or BAMLANIVIMAB, how mutations at each site in the receptor binding domain affect binding by this antibody. I'm showing the average effect of mutations at a site. So you can see this particular antibody is unaffected by mutations at most sites in the receptor binding domain, but it's escaped by mutations at sites like 452, 484, and 490. And so this turns out to be extraordinarily unfortunate because the Delta variant had a mutation at site 452, uh, and then almost every other SARS-CoV-2 variant has had a mutation at site 484. Uh, and so this antibody, almost as soon as it got emergency youth authorization, it was obsolete and it stopped being distributed. This actually happened with many of the uh, antibody therapeutics that were initially developed. And so one thing that sort of these observations suggest, and, and something that's now actively going on in both academic and biotech research, is that in the future, if you were to try to uh, develop an antibody therapeutic to SARS-CoV-2, you might want to figure out what are going to be the escape mutations from that antibody early on before you, you know, throw millions of dollars into developing the antibody, and then try to choose antibodies to develop that are targeting sites that we at least think are less likely to change rapidly during the virus's evolution. And that's going on right now with the second generation antibody therapeutics. But what I really want to focus on and what's of greatest interest uh, to our lab is what about polyclonal antibodies? And just to make the point really clear, uh, a monoclonal antibody is like a single antibody species, which is usually nowadays produced recombinantly that you know, a company might make and it binds to one part of the virus. And if the virus gets a mutation where the monoclonal antibody binds, it usually doesn't bind anymore. However, the human immune system makes a polyclonal antibody response, which basically consists of a very large number of different monoclonal antibodies. And these polyclonal antibodies can at least potentially bind to many regions of the virus. So even if the virus gets a mutation in one region, the antibodies sort of uh, will still be binding to other regions. 
And this means that the polyclonal antibody response is going to be less affected by any single mutation. So it's important to then know where do these polyclonal antibodies actually bind. And so I'm going to now illustrate these experimental measurements uh, that we've developed and then other groups have developed using the techniques I described to figure out where these polyclonal antibodies are binding and how mutations might affect that. So to understand how I'm representing these data, first just imagine we only had three antibodies. Let's imagine humans only made three antibodies, the pink one, the purple one, and the blue one. And if for each of these antibodies, we measure where it binds in the virus, shown here in the pink, the blue, and the purple curves, you can kind of get a sense of the overall binding profile of that antibody by just averaging these together, which gives you the black line. You can also then observe that if the virus got a mutation, such as at position 484, it's going to escape the purple antibody. And if that happens, the overall binding profile is going to look different because the purple antibody's activity goes away. So that's sort of the principle of what I'm showing you. We're just figuring out where lots of individual antibodies bind, and then we're aggregating those data together and then seeing how individual mutations would affect that mix of binding. And so the reason this is uh, powerful is over about the first uh, year and a half of the pandemic, uh, Tyler Starr and Ali Greeny in our group were able to make these complete maps of antibody escape for 36 different antibodies. And then the really amazing thing is a group of Yoon Long, Richard Cao, and collaborators at Peking University were sort of able to industrialize this deep mutational scanning approach by, by making a variety of technical innovations and just having a lot of people work on it, uh, and now have these maps for over 3,000 monoclonal antibodies. So this starts to really let us understand where antibodies are targeting on the receptor binding domain. And so what is this data, which, we can, which my group has integrated into this so-called escape calculator, tell us about the evolution that's already happened. Uh, so I'm actually gonna, rather than go through my slides, I'm just gonna show this uh, interactively. Uh, so here's this escape calculator, which our group generated with these data. So what I'm showing here is all antibodies that neutralize Omicron BA2, what are the sites where mutations can escape those antibodies? And so this was data that was generated in sort of early 2022, uh, after, shortly after Omicron BA2 had emerged. And when you look at this data, you can say, all right, the main sites that are targeted by antibodies that neutralize BA2 are sites like 486, 444, and 346. A few months later, there was this new variant called Omicron BA5 that emerged, and the key mutation in BA5 is at 486. So that now knocked off a lot of the antibodies that bound at 486. Then there was a descendant of BA5 that emerged and became dominant in the US, and it had then picked up a mutation at site 444, which knocked off more of these antibodies. Then BQ.1 gave rise to another descendant, which has been one of the main variants in the US, called BQ.1.1, which has now picked up a mutation at the highest remaining peak, uh, 346. And you know, there's now future variants arising uh, from these. And I've just found this extraordinary, like we generate these maps uh, and then it's almost like the virus is just like looking at our data and picking which mutations uh, to make next. Uh, you know, obviously that's not what's really happening. It's just the evolutionary selection process. But I think it really shows how strongly selection from neutralizing antibodies is determining which mutations are arising in these variants and how by understanding where the antibodies bind, we can to a substantial degree understand that process. Uh, okay, so the next few slides just kind of show what I showed uh, sort of uh, in a, in a non-interactive form for anyone who goes to the slides. So I just want to sort of conclude the key points of this talk. Uh, first of all, as I described, a subset of human respiratory viruses evolve to escape immunity. Not all of them. Measles doesn't, but flu and common cold coronaviruses do. Uh, you know, unfortunately, coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2, are in this rapidly evolving set. The most important antigenic evolution occurs in this receptor binding domain, but we now fortunately have techniques to prospectively map the effects of mutations to interpret this evolution. And this is really useful in viral surveillance and the develop of, development of monoclonal antibody therapeutics, and hopefully it will eventually be possible to leverage some of these insights for improved vaccine design as well. 
And then I'd like to end with some thanks. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Tyler, who is a postdoc in my lab, who's now a professor at the University of Utah, who along with Ali Greeny, who is an MD PhD student, did most of the work I described today. Uh, Rachel did the work with coronavirus 229E. And then Bernadetta, Kate, and Kalen have developed this powerful new method that we think will greatly expand the scope and utility of these deep mutational scanning methods. And I'll describe that new approach uh, tomorrow, I think at 4 p.m., for the infectious diseases grand rounds. Uh, I'd like, like to also thank a number of collaborators, our funding sources, and just to mention again, the slides I presented are available at this link. And I'm now happy to take questions. Uh, and unless anybody interrupts me and tells me otherwise, I'm planning on just taking those questions by looking in the Q&A box. Jesse, let me just um, let me just say that was an amazing talk. Um, it was clear. It was engaging. It was sobering. It was inspiring. All these things. Um, oh, 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 before we... at least yeah, well, it wasn't uh, <laughs> mind numbing. I just I just go for not mind numbing is my goal. But <laughs> <laughs> that you achieved. Um, okay. Before we go to the Q and A, I just want to give Tom Merrigan, if he would like, um, an opportunity to ask a question. It is, after all. Um, a lectureship in his honor, and it's his birthday. So, Tom, if you are able to activate your video, or at least the the audio, love to hear if you have a, a question you'd like to ask Jesse before we turn to the Q and A. Okay, I am unmuted. I think. Can you hear I me? Can hear you. Yes. yes, we can hear you. Well, I I think that uh, this has been a very powerful presentation of the kind of methodology it takes to get at what is, inter what is the interaction between the virus and the host. And uh, this kind of objective uh, scientific work is obviously the way we will control the virus in the long run. And uh, antibodies might be the first, but I think the vaccines will follow in being influenced by this kind of work. Uh, I have another thing, though. We're in a real world. And uh, I remember in that world with HIV, uh, I remember debating uh, whether the virus was being causing the infection with the Minister of Health in uh, South Africa. And the country was just not getting what the right advice as far as how to handle infected people and how to stop the spread of the virus. But it, you know, political factors controlled the application of the findings of scientists. And I think we live in a world where that's happening here. And whether it's uh, uh, the Chinese premier uh, lifting the no COVID and never having, and, that, and not accepting vaccine from the rest of the world, which works. Uh, so his population will be the first population to be exposed to the ferocity of the virus without having any previous immunity. Uh, it's a, a very difficult situation we have. And we have American deniers of science in, in this area. Uh, the, uh, for example, the governor of Florida. Uh, and, and I think these kind of things come in and upset the application of these beautiful scientific insights we have. And I'm sure uh, our speaker has his response to that because he, he sees it up close uh, as to whether the things that follow readily from his findings are rapidly developed or not, for example. But why don't I turn it over to him? I'm, I'm bringing up the political consequences of the virus and, and the need for uh, having understanding politicians who can implement science in a good way? Yeah, so that, that's a good question, good points. I mean, I guess the, the best I can say, I mean, it's certainly true that uh, not all scientific advances have been translated as effectively as they could uh, into public health measures because of uh, political factors. You know, I think as scientists, like my view is the best we can do is try to, you know, do high quality science and try to communicate that is, is clearly uh, and as straightforwardly as possible. And I, I certainly agree with the sort of, you know, some of the dire aspects of, you know, uh, sometimes people ignoring clear scientific information. You know, I would also say that it's important to recognize that there's a counterpoint to that. Like one of the things that 
that amazes me is how many people who aren't scientists have become very knowledgeable and very highly engaged in these sorts of scientific issues, you know, through things like Twitter and the popular media. And there's a lot of sort of the general public that's not trained as scientists. that's also very knowledgeable about that. And I mean, I think as scientists, the best we can do is try to not, or at least my approach, is not to try to get that engaged in the political fights and just try to put out the information and explain it as best and as clearly as we can. And, you know, that may not always work, but I think it's it's difficult to do much beyond that within the confines of science. But yeah, I agree, it's a, it's a major challenge. Well, I think it's wonderful that you have concentrated on being able to communicate to the general public uh, what's going on here. So that it isn't just a scientist speaking to scientists, but you thought this is important and you have uh, watered down or at least made it more easily understandable to the general public. And, and I think that's a very important part of your function. And I enjoyed the fact that it was here in these Grand Rounds because Grand Rounds is not, uh, is, is talking to non specialists in the area and you really need to have a simple, clear uh, story to be telling rather than all the complexities you might be presented with. Yeah, yeah. So, so thank you for the question. Uh, and now I'll, I'll get to a few questions in the chat. So one, uh, Jill Chu's question, will dangerous SARS-CoV-2 variants emerge from poor countries with large, large immunosuppressed populations due to poor control of HIV? Uh, potentially, although that said, you know, when we look uh, over what's happened so far, the major SARS-CoV-2 variants we've seen have emerged in a number of different uh, geographical locations. I mean, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of SARS-CoV-2 infected people and a lot of immunosuppressed individuals all over the world. So, yeah, I, I, I certainly think that that's one place they can emerge, but I don't know if that's a much higher risk than, than other regions. Uh, and it's important to emphasize that Omicron almost certainly evolved in a chronically infected individual, but some of that subsequent evolution, like the evolution of BQ.1.1, probably happened during normal acute transmissions because all the evolutionary intermediates were observed. Uh, M. Nasca asks, what's the fastest mutating virus ever known to humans? Uh, the virus with the highest mutation rate, it's probably something like HIV, but I want to emphasize actually that mutation rate, so how fast like mutations just arise when the virus is copying its genome, is not the same as evolution in terms of adaptive changes. So one of the reasons that many people early on argued that SARS-CoV-2 would not evolve to escape antibodies is its underlying mutation rate in terms of how often it makes mistakes is actually lower than some other human RNA respiratory viruses. But because so many of those mutations give the virus a big advantage in escaping antibodies, even though it's making the mutations at a slightly lower rate, the, the net rate of adaptation is, is still quite high. So mutation rate basically isn't everything, evolution. Uh, Thomas Burns asks, why do you think the new bivalent vaccine is not much better than the original vaccine? So yeah, the evidence is that there's some evidence that the serum antibody titers from the bivalent BA5 uh, Wuhan H1 vaccine are a little bit better against uh, the Omicron variants than, than just getting another dose of the original vaccine. But the improvement is like, you know, measuring things like factors of two, not, not factors of 10. Uh, I think it's because there's a strong effect of imprinting, which is just something that unfortunately always happens with rapidly evolving viruses. Your first exposure was to something that rapidly becomes old. Uh, that said, I do think there's some reason to think that uh, the bivalent vaccine and, and sort of new immunogens are eliciting some changes in the memory B cell compartment that aren't initially uh, represented by higher serum antibody tires, but may after sort of repeated exposures, uh, be, you know, either through more vaccine doses or through infections with newer variants may become important. So in my view, uh, it's, you know, if people are gonna keep getting boosters, uh, I think it's a good idea to keep those boosters as contemporary as possible. Uh, and, uh, but I agree the bivalent vaccine that the changes, at least in serum antibody titers from a single dose are fairly modest in, in terms of relative to the original vaccine. Uh, Aaron Bendavid asks, what's your view on vaccine generating pressure for immune escape? Uh, and this actually became a topic of a lot of interest because there was a Wall Street Journal uh, editorial sort of asking the question, uh, did vaccines drive the emergence of, of new variants? I actually think vaccines probably, uh, 
at, at a net level at steady state play very little role in increasing the rate of viral antigenic evolution because the truth is unless a country is taking draconian measures like China was and now nobody is, uh, people basically end up with immunity to this virus is one way or the other. If you don't get vaccinated, you're gonna get infected. Sometimes even if you get vaccinated, you're gonna get infected. And so people are gonna end up with immunity from infection or vaccination. And then that immunity is gonna drive viral evolution. Uh, so I don't know that vaccines are really increasing the net immunity in the population at steady state that much. I tend to think of vaccines more as a way to get the immunity to people via a vaccination rather than an infection, which is, you know, in my view, a desirable thing because, uh, you know, infections at minimum make people sick and sometimes have severe consequences, whereas the vaccine typically generates just kind of a sore arm. So I, I think, you know, in reality, these viruses are going to evolve antigenically as soon as the population has immunity and the population is going to have immunity whether or not people get vaccinated, because if they don't get vaccinated, sometimes, like I said, even if they do, they're going to get infected. Uh, Rosalind asks, thanks for the lecture. Uh, what is the prediction of your ability to formulate a polyclonal vaccine that will give durable protection? Uh, I think this is a really difficult challenge uh, because the virus is changing that much. I do think there are various vaccine strategies that have some promise. Uh, these include nanoparticle uh, like formulations like uh, Pamela Bjorkman's lab or Peter Kim's group at Stanford and various others have used. Uh, they include cocktails of mRNA vaccines and sort of various other innovative approaches. I think there's a possibility that some of these vaccine formulations will give sort of broader, more durable protection. But it's important to emphasize that at this point, they're basically all in the research stage and there's no guarantee. Uh, Stan uh, asks, what is known about escape from T-cell immunity? Uh, there's very little uh, evidence of much escape from T-cell immunity in SARS-CoV-2. And even for heavily studied viruses like influenza viruses, there's not that much evidence. And I think there are two reasons for that. Uh, first, uh, T-cell immunity mostly sort of ameliorates the severity of disease rather than blocking infection and transmission altogether. And from the virus's perspective, it may not really matter as much what happens two or three days into your infection as transmission blocking immunity. So I think T cells put less pressure on the virus. The second factor is that the epitopes that are targeted in T cells by different people are highly diverse across the population because we have different MHC alleles. So if the virus gets a T cell escape mutation in me, most likely I'm gonna transmit it to someone who has a different MHC allele and that mutation won't give the virus a benefit in the next person. And so for a rapidly evolving virus, it's jumping from person to person a lot. This MHC diversity really sort of slows down the efficiency of selection and I think slows down escape. Uh, in contrast, viruses that evolve for a really long time in the same person, like HIV, uh, tend to be under much stronger uh, selection for T cell immunity because there's constant selection in one MHC background. Uh, Wang C asks, we rarely see multiple strains of the same virus in the same host. Uh, I've often wondered what the viral biological reason for this is. I, I think the main reason is that, you know, in order to get two strains of virus in the same host, the person has to either be simultaneously infected with two different strains or have a very, very long infection for these two strains to diverge. And people are not co-infected that often. You know, most of the time, most people aren't infected with SARS-CoV-2. So being doubly infected is a, is a rarer event, but it does happen. Like this XBB variant emerged through recombination, uh, which means that there was some person that was infected with two different variants that then recombined to form XBB. And there have been other co-infections observed in humans, but it's going to be a small fraction of all infections. Uh, Edward uh, asks, is there any evidence that differences among human ACE2 receptors exist that affect the individual susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 binding and consequent infection? No, at least not at the level of any common segregating genetic variation in the human population. There, there could be rare private variants. I'm not that knowledgeable about the genetics of ACE2, but there are no common variants of ACE2 in the human population uh, in, the, in the region of ACE2 that SARS-CoV-2 binds to. Uh, Kavitam asks, uh, would RBD mutations variable among different populations uh, by age or gender? And is there any evidence of that? At this point, there's not uh, much evidence of that. Uh, for other viruses like influenza virus, uh, 
there have been some evidence that some mutations will help the virus more in some age groups than others. Uh, not much has been observed for, for gender for influenza virus. Uh, and the reason for that is thought to be that people who have different exposure histories often end up making antibodies with different specificities, which then means different mutations are beneficial to the virus. So for influenza virus, it's been circulating in humans for a long time. So my exposure histories very different from the exposure histories of my daughters and probably from, from most of you here. Uh, because SARS-CoV-2 has only been in the human population for a short time, most people, uh, particularly until about a year ago, had essentially the same exposure history. You know, they'd gotten exposed to the early an early variant. Uh, I would expect that as SARS-CoV-2 continues to evolve and people accumulate more diverse exposure histories, that could lead to more person-to-person -person variation in the benefits of RBD mutations. Uh, and by the way, think, should I go ahead and keep doing these or people can yeah, leave maybe, anytime? I don't know if you need to say anything. But. Yeah, I don't know um, uh, whether, you know, we have a lot of people who want to stay on. Your answers have been great. Maybe we take one more and then um, we'll probably call it a day. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, so uh, I'll take Bob Schaefer's question, which is how important is glycosylation for the RBD? And is it reproduced faithfully in the yeast EMS experiments? Uh, Yeast do glycosylate slightly different than mammalian cells, uh, but based on everything we've seen, uh, that hasn't led to sort of discrepancies in our experiments yet. We think the main limitation of the yeast display RBD is that it's not capturing the full quaternary environment or full quaternary confirmation that the RBD exists in, in the context of full spike. And we have seen cases where we think the yeast DMS is sort of giving incorrect results because of that. Uh, we haven't seen any cases where we think the results are affected by glycosylation, although it's it's possible in principle. And the full spike demutational scanning I'll talk about uh, tomorrow with the ID rounds sort of uh, hopefully provides a way to get around this. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm sorry to not have time to answer the other questions. You can always email them to me. Anytime no, this, this was great, Jesse. Um, you've done everyone a great service and it's been also a pleasure. Um, so let me just thank you again. Thank everyone for attending. Thank Tom for his inspiring history of work here. And I'll just invite everyone. You're all welcome to join us at ID Grand Rounds tomorrow, Thursday at four o'clock. Um, Jesse will be going into deeper, uh, more detail on the deep mutational scanning uh, work that he's been doing. So thank you all and um, have a good rest of your week. All right. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.